Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for our program entitled The Risky Business of the Federal False Claims Act, Strategic Thinking for 2017. I'm Bobby Higdon, litigation partner at Williams Mullen, and your moderator for today's seminar. Joining me are fellow litigation partners Tony Anikeff and John Davis. Tony co-chairs our government contracts team, and John co-chairs our white collar and investigations team. Our False Claims Act practice attorneys have extensive federal and state experience. We represent businesses in numerous industries, including healthcare providers and defense and government contractors, which have undergone investigations and litigation against government entities under the False Claims Act. Now, before we start, we, we want to cover just sort of a number of, of uh, broad topics. So why is there an FCA? What is the False Claims Act? And give you an overview. John will highlight the criminal aspects of it, and Tony will highlight the civil aspects of it. Um, we want to talk a little bit about what can comprise a False Claims Act violation, but I want to stop on the question of why is the FCA important to you? In the last um, five or six years, the Justice Department in Washington has collected more than $26 billion as a result of civil and criminal False Claims Act litigation, excuse me, investigations and settlements. Their uh, priority focuses have been health care providers, government contractors, anyone receiving government funds. And they are aggressive and they are very serious about enforcing these laws. And so one of the, the premises of our thinking is that if you're involved in government contracting, it's really not a question of whether or not you will encounter a false claims investigation. It's just a question of when you will encounter that. And so we want to launch into a discussion of these things. Um, and kind of give you some, some, some things to think about and some ways to protect your companies. And so, Tony, let me turn to you. Oh, before we do that, let me give you some housekeeping notes. For our webinar attendees, we encourage you to ask any questions throughout the program using the chat feature on your screen. Following our presentation, we will have a dedicated time to respond to those questions. To minimize audio interference, phone lines have been muted. Also, please place any cell phones away from your landline so we can have better sound quality for everyone. For those of you who are interested in CLE credits in North Carolina, South Carolina, or Virginia, we'll be following up on today's program to confirm your information. So let's begin. Tony, let me turn to you first. And how about giving us a little bit of the background of the False Claims Act? Um, well, first, why don't we, we're probably going to address a little bit about why there's a False Claims Act. And the fact is that for whatever reason, people who do business with the government as contractors or healthcare providers or the like, uh, some small percentage of them have a propensity to cheat the government rather than treating it as an honor. Um, the False Claims Act in the United States has its origins in the Civil War during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln uh, when troops found that when they went to get uh, rifles, uh, they didn't work. And when they went to get munitions, the ammunition boxes were filled with river rock. <laughs> um, that propensity has continued up into the present day. Uh, almost every day when one reads the newspaper, uh, one sees that doctors have charged the government uh, for providing medical services when that doesn't occur, uh, that uh, products that uh, should have worked don't work. We've all read about Lance Armstrong billing the federal government $4 million, having promised that he wasn't doped up when he was. And there are innumerable large companies that would like to fit through the eye hole of being a small business, when in fact they're not. And given the creativity of key TAM relators, which we'll discuss later on, the breadth of Potential False Claims Act continues to uh, increase. Why is that happening? Since the 80s, the government has turned increasingly from companies that were strictly in the government contract space increasingly to a whole host of commercial providers to do the government's work. Um, pretty much if it is a service or product, the government buys it from a provider. And the third reason there's a False Claims Act is there's no pushback. It's politically popular to increase the breadth and the penalties of the False Claims Act, and without a lobby to push back on it, what we're seeing is a statute that uh, continues to expand uh, 
the uh, bar to success continues to get lowered, uh, and the damages that can flow from it continue to increase. John, let me ask you to just take up the uh, False Claims Act from a criminal perspective and talk to us about uh, what it penalizes and, and why there is a False Claims Act from that angle. The False Claims Act has always been both a criminal and civil uh, enforcement statute. And the criminal statute, the main one is at Section 287 of the Federal Criminal Code. It's very simple. Uh, a defendant who makes or presents a claim, a claim for payment to any agency of the United States, knowing that claim to be false, fictitious, or fraudulent, commits a felony each time that claim is submitted. So a couple of points about the criminal law. One is, obviously, it requires criminal intent or mens rea. The conduct must be knowing, and it can't be just an accident or negligence. In <clears throat> typically today, many more of our cases are civil, not criminal. I would say that criminal cases are re reserved, in the government's mind, for blatant or egregious fraud. The statute itself is not used that often. Uh, both Bobby and I were prosecutors for a long time, and we didn't have a lot of 287 cases, largely because there are other statutes, such as mail and wire fraud, um, <clears throat> that, are, that have higher penalties and may be easier to prove. Um, many times, the, the possibility of a criminal prosecution is more a threat than a reality that the, all parties are negotiating, and, and one of the things we're trying to do as defense counsel is move the government away from the criminal realm into the civil or administrative. Uh, that happens a lot, and a lot of cases don't, don't end up going criminal. So what's an example? At the simplest level, take a health care provider um, in a Medicaid fraud situation. The company provides personal care services to the elderly in their homes and bills Medicaid for $123 for an eight-hour day. Employees at that company forge patient signatures on the, on the five-day time, uh, time sheets that, that have to be kept, and those claims are then submitted electronically to Medicaid uh, for hours that were not actually worked. That's a false claim. Each time that electronic bill is submitted to Medicaid for work that wasn't actually done by people who know they're committing fraud, um, that's, a, that's a separate federal crime, potentially. <clears throat> Another uh, statute just worth mentioning is, is the 1001 is, is a statute that's used in many, many cases, and, but also goes back with its roots in the False Claims Act. Um, it, it penalizes false statements even that are not attached to a claim, such as making a false statement to a federal agent who's interviewing you. So uh, false statements, Bobby, are, are something that the government has been going after criminally since the beginning of the feds. So. Absolutely. Every federal agent knows to talk about 1,001 violations. Right. So it's a very common charge. Tony, let me turn back from the civil side and, and have you address what, what the False Claims Act penalizes from a civil standpoint. I, I will, and as we do so, I'd like to just briefly refer back to Section 101. Government contractors know it very well because <laughs> at the bottom of the federal form, if you want to submit a request for a change order or a request for an equitable adjustment, it says at the bottom when you sign it, you are doing so pursuant to 18 U.S. Code 1001. So with that happy thought, we'll turn to the civil <laughs> side. The civil side, and, and the goal, as John said, the goal of all of us is to take a criminal matter and move it to the civil side, and the goal of us on the civil side is to take the Civil False Claims Act and convert it to a breach of contract, which is not a False Claims Act violation, and then get summary judgment and have the breach of contract case thrown out. That doesn't often happen. Um, so we have to deal with 31 U.S. Code, Section 3729 and following. And what does it penalize? It penalizes a number of things. But the major one is this concept of a false claim where one knowingly presents or causes to present a false claim for payment or approval. And I, and I stop there for a minute because most of us think it involves the payment of money. It does, 
but it also can be seeking approval, i.e. submitting a false document that you are entitled to be considered a small business can constitute a small claim. The companion to the false claim is the false statement. And there you use a false record or statement uh, in support of your fraudulent claim. They are usually asserted together um, because usually one uses a document in order to affect the false claim. Um, the next concept is conspiracy. If two companies or two persons get together and they hatch a plan to provide a defective product and to create an invoice, they have advanced the potential false claim, and if they take an act in furtherance of it, you trip up that clause. Um, the other thing that one sees a lot, because the government and key TAM relators are aggressive about it, is a reverse false claim. Um, it involves two things. One is if you have a duty to pay something to the government, i.e., you have bought real estate uh, or you have bought surplus products and you owe the money and you create a false invoice that understates what you're supposed to do, that trips the statute. The more common one that the government uses is that you conceal or knowingly try to deceive the government on money that you owe back. If the government has sent you double payment on an invoice, you're supposed to pay it back. Um, where it comes up a lot is that the government asserts what is essentially a breach of contract and then says, in addition to the breach, you should pay all the money back that we've given you. And it's important to keep in mind that a mere breach of contract is not a False Claims Act, but government agents and key TAM relators will often try to assert that the mere fact you breached the contract necessarily was a False Claims Act violation and you should be paying back everything that you were paid. So what are the elements of a Civil False Claims Act? Um, they involve a false statement or a fraudulent course of conduct. That's the bad act. That you do it with scienter, a nice word that we'll talk about in a minute, um, that's material that we'll also talk about uh, in a second, and that there be a claim to the government. So let's look at that. Let's drill down a bit. The concept of a claim is a demand for money or property, i.e., you'd like the government to pay something. Um, in the old days, it was something that had to be submitted directly to the federal government. So if you were a subcontractor and you submitted it to a prime contractor and it never got to the government, there was no false claim. The law has now changed as part of the expansion so that it also includes a submission to a contractor, a grantee, or other recipient in the food chain where it's going to involve the payment of money by the government or the government is going to reimburse the person to whom you submitted a document. So if you submit a false document or you represent to the prime contractor that, the, uh, that something you made is going to work and it doesn't, then the mere fact that the government's going to pay for that allows the government to come after you, the subcontractor, leap over the prime contractor and come after you. So the standards. What is that word scienter? It's a knowledge. It can be actual knowledge. And if you have actual knowledge, you are in the area that depending on the knowledge that you have, you also may be facing criminal exposure. But it can also be deliberate ignorance of the truth, um, sometimes known as the ostrich, in the ostrich head in the sand. Um, if you're the CEO, and your program manager comes to you and says, um, you know, I think it's okay that we're only half our people are working 20 hours a week. I'm just going to put an extra 20 hours on the timesheets so that we bill our full 40 hours. And the CEO says, is that okay? And you say, yeah, it's sure it's okay. The CEO hasn't done enough. And we had a case where the agents told us that the CEO came within a smidge that's a technical false claims act term, of being prosecuted criminally. The third one, which is troubling, is reckless disregard for the truth. So breach of contract is not necessarily false claims. Negligence is not false claims. But the distance, uh, the intellectual distance between negligence and reckless disregard for the truth is what creates great fodder for key TAM relators. And then the key thing is that it has to be material, which is have a natural tendency 
to influence or be capable of influencing the payment or receipt of money or property. And John is going to talk uh, a good bit about materiality when we get to a Supreme Court case. The key takeaway on this, of course, is that specific intent to defraud is not required, and that often comes as a surprise to corporations. Now, John, how about let me turn back to you and ask you to talk a little bit about whistleblowers and their role in this and the protections that they have. The first rule for a company is don't make false claims to the government. The second rule is don't retaliate <laughs> against employees who can, who can claim to be whistleblowers. The False Claims Act and other federal statutes now have a, a burgeoning um, a set of litigation related to whistleblower protection. And today, right under the False Claims Act, a, a <clears throat> whistleblower who has been retaliated against can bring a direct action in federal court with a three-year statute of limitations. There's plenty of time to investigate it and prepare the complaint um, and seek twice back pay, interest on back pay, compensation for damages, and attorney's fees and litigation costs. There's a lot of money at stake and get reinstatement. Um, so who has these rights? Well, a lot of people claim to have them, and, and sometimes they do, but companies have to be very, very careful about how they deal with so-called whistleblowers. If a company takes an adverse action of almost any kind, including termination and, and much less, which is a discrimination in the terms and conditions of employment uh, against an employee, and the employee can show or allege that that retaliation is because of, quote, lawful acts done by the employee, either in furtherance of a False Claims Act investigation or in an effort to stop a violation of the False Claims Act, the employee can, can position himself or herself uh, in, in uh, being able to make that retaliation claim. There is a right of action there. And, and the employee doesn't even have to have filed a False Claims Act complaint, need, need only be allegedly investigating. So um, being very, again, very careful about responding to employees who make allegations of false claims uh, misconduct is absolutely critical. And, and in that regard, uh, we talked earlier about being politically popular and expanding the reach of the False Claims Act. There are two with regard to whistleblowers. The first is the U.S. Defense of Trade Secrets Act, which provides immunity from criminal and civil actions if an employee confidentially discloses a trade secret to a relevant federal official or an attorney engaged in a lawsuit when the purpose is solely to report or investigate suspected violations of law or if it is in a sealed filing in court. Second, perhaps of more importance to government contractors, is that the Federal Acquisition Regulation bars the application of an NDA or a confidentiality agreement in being applied to any employee working on a government contract regarding the disclosure of confidential information in a good faith report to a federal official uh, for the purpose of disclosing fraud, waste, and abuse. Before we go on, let me just uh, put a place marker here. Um, we have we've been talking mostly at this point about um, federal investigations, federal prosecutions, and federal civil liability. And that's what we're going to cover because, uh, for the most of, of today because that's where the real action has been historically and that's where it continues to be. But we'd be remiss if we didn't point out to everyone that there is a growing body of law at the state level where states are in effect adopting similar principles, similar statutes to enforce um, uh, claims against their citizens at that level. Some of the states have uh, enacted very broad legislation, North Carolina, Virginia, the District of Columbia have. Others have limited it to particular topics, subject matter areas, or areas where the, the government is heavily involved. For example, in South Carolina, they focused on Medicaid. But this is an area that is of increasing exposure and liability, and one that everyone needs to be reminded of and be aware of. And importantly, uh, what you often have is you have state and federal investigators working together they're working with state and federal prosecutors, and a decision is not made until later in the process. 
as to where the matter will be addressed from a civil or criminal standpoint. And often the uh, analysis is really where can they obtain the greatest penalties, the greatest uh, enforcement, um, and that they can't know that until they have fully investigated it. So there is um, criminal and civil exposure at both the federal and state level in many of these investigations. So well, let's turn back to you know, the question of what are false claims and with respect to specific industries. And Tony, how about you address that a little bit for us? Well, you know, it's interesting because the, the False Claims Act really is agnostic as to industry. One can, uh, one can conjure up a false claim under almost any industry. We, we noticed in looking at some research uh, yesterday that teachers who falsified grades uh, of their students <laughs> were alleged to have committed a false claims act because the school district received funds and were told to administer those funds in a responsible manner. And a key TAM relator said that if you are falsifying your students' grades, that constitutes a false claims act. Um, but one, you know, there are all sorts of areas. If you are, if your business development people are not talking to your tech folks, and you put a promise in your offer that you're going to provide training and you don't do so. Or if you have a rocket that you say can go to the moon and it can't. Um, or if it floats and it doesn't. Those are all potential False Claims Act violations. Defective products and services are, are fairly easy, but one needs to be conscious about what one is saying about what one's products can do and the services you provide. If you are saying you're providing medical care and you're providing it with somebody who doesn't have a medical degree, then you may be in trouble. False invoices, you know, you double the cost or you say you produced a widget and you didn't. Timekeeping fraud, we talked earlier, the person that doubles the amount of time that they actually worked when in fact they didn't. Misrepresenting qualifications. People often forget to check the background of the key personnel that they're putting on a proposal. And not only does that as a contract matter mean that all that money gets returned, but you can be prosecuted under the False Claims Act. Um, an extreme example was a uh, creative fellow. He had a high school degree. He ended up convincing two fairly high-level scientific companies to hire him as the head of their IT departments, respectively. He was billing over 24 hours a day on the strength that he had a master's degree and a doctorate degree from Oxford, when in fact he hadn't graduated from high school. Um, one of those companies fared very badly. One of those companies fared a little bit better, um, but it was a tough going for both of them. And then John, the medical industry is of course uh, rife with potential. Healthcare is where the money is of course today, and there's a huge number of <coughs> varieties of health, of False Claims Act investigations involving healthcare providers of all stripes. I would I would uh, say that five of the major kinds of cases today. One is traditional false billings, uh, hours not worked or services not actually performed or caregivers who were not actually the certified um, provider who should have been providing the service. So false billing that's traditional. A second is upcoding, particularly because CPT codes have various um, four, four or five different um, uh, numbers and oftentimes different compensation rates. Um, upcoding, which is simply claiming more compensation or compensation at a higher rate than you're entitled to, is also a kind of false claim. The third that is, again, growing and increasing is medically unnecessary services, and this is seen a lot now. So you can have a false claim, you can have a licensed doctor and a and healthcare service that's fully legitimate, not, not doing anything that any of us would think is criminal. But the government's theory is that the whole business model and um, the, uh, the way that patients are identified and the, the schedule at which they're treated um, is medically unnecessary. It's more than is needed. The government is paying, is paying a whole lot of money under Medicare, um, and medically, if they're knowingly medically unnecessary services, that's a false claims act theory. Another area today, particularly in nursing homes, is worthless services. 
services that are provided. They're not misdescribed on a form, but there's so many quality control issues with uh, that nursing home and its cleanliness and, and um, um, it, it's just the basic way it's treating um, is its residents gives the government the ability to say all of these services are worthless and, and a, a big chunk of your claims are false claims. The last area is certifications, both implied and false, and I'll turn it back to Tony. Yeah, so this is sort of one of the hot spots in the False Claims Act area. Um, for those who may have been in business for a long time, if you think back to the government contracts you had to sign back in the 90s and 80s, the reps and certs um, generally involved whether you had been debarred or prosecuted for fraud and the like, uh, there might have been a Buy America Act, but it was basically contained on a single page. Um, today, the reps and certs go on for pages. And in addition, there are a whole host of representations that you are making without actually signing your initials. And those fall into two categories. There is express certifications and there are the implied ones. Express is fairly easy. Um, it is whether you're a small business or not. It's whether you have a license or not. It's whether your products were made in the United States, if you say they are. It's did you conform to the specifications that were provided, and when you say you have a master's degree or a doctorate, do you in fact have them? Those are the easy cases when you make a misrepresentation. It is much more difficult, however, when you deal with the implied certifications, and John's going to talk about that in a minute in regard to a Supreme Court case. But People give little thought that as they read this government contract or they read the prime contract, there is a clause that says you will agree to comply with all laws that pertain to this contract, whatever they might be. Were you certified to be in compliance with all of those laws? Or you get a contract and it references 30 NIST standards, National Institute of Testing, or it cites a Medicare rule. Well, that Medicare rule might be 700 pages long, and it might refer to other documents. And John and I both know and went through a case where we were into a secondary document on page 600 down at the bottom of the page, and the U.S. attorney was saying, well, of course you should have known about that. Um, if you look at where industry is going today, cybersecurity is the new frontier, and people are required to protect the government's data through an incredibly complex set of regulations. When you sign the contract, you are certifying that all the government's data is safe. So these are all you know, implied certifications, and they are the area where you don't necessarily know what you're certifying. And John is going to talk about a case called Escobar and how that has kind of thrown this area into a jumble. Escobar was decided in the U.S. Supreme Court in June of this year, and it's about a uh, False Claims Act case involving a mental health counseling service in Massachusetts. The facts in the case are unusually egregious. Um, um, in most of the cases we see the, the, the so-called misconduct is much more nuanced, but in, in Escobar, this mental health counseling service had unlicensed providers, it had um, employees who had, who had committed fraud and gotten false national provider identity identification numbers that they're using on forms. They had a, someone posing as a psychiatrist who was um, simply a nurse, and lots of stuff was happening that was unsupervised. It was a real, um, a real mess. And I might, as an old prosecutor, I would say, why didn't they take this case criminally? But they, they didn't, um, uh, and someone died. Someone uh, uh, bipolar eventually died in, the, in this situation. <clears throat> the, the False Claims Act theory that was brought in the District Court of Massachusetts was rejected, and the District Court actually ruled against the plaintiffs um, because they use the so-called implied certification theory. Uh, that is not, it, it isn't that the, the claim forms themselves are false, but that basic requirements about licensing and certification and supervision were totally ignored by the company. And so 
there's an implied certification that those things are being done, and when that's false, there's a false claims act. The federal court in Massachusetts rejected that theory. The First Circuit um, reversed and allowed it, and the Supreme Court took the case. There are really two important developments uh, from Escobar. The first fairly basic is that implied certification is now a viable theory. Uh, uh, so that if you have if you have basic contractual requirements that go to the the core of the important stuff that uh, the contractor is doing and they're being violated, there's a false claims act theory even if the, the claim forms themselves are accurate. Um, the, the Supreme Court talks about at least in this example uh, to have the theory the company has to make specific representations about the goods or services it provides in, in a situation where undisclosed non-compliance, again, this implied certification theory, makes the representations misleading. So, so relators and the government can definitely sue on an implied certification theory. The second development from Escobar, and, and really the more interesting one in my view, is that the materiality standard seems to be heightened. Remember what Tony said, False Claims Act, uh, one of the elements is the claim has to be material to payment. It can't be something that doesn't matter, in other words. And what Escobar says is it focuses on the, history, the payment history between the government and the contractor, meaning what did the government know about the deficiency, about the contractual violation how long has it known it, and what effect did it have on the government's decision to pay? And Escobar, Escobar makes very clear that if the government has known, as it often does in my experience, if it's known for years, or at least had good reason to know for years about a, about a non-compliance with a contractual provision, but continues to pay the claims year after year after year, there is a very strong argument now on, on, on uh, behalf of the business and the defendant in the case that it is just not a material falsehood and therefore there is no cause of action. So that's what Escobar does. Um, John, we've had it in place now six months. Can either you or Tony detect any trends in how it's being interpreted by lower courts or applied in these prosecutions and, and, uh, and otherwise? Uh, I would say only the First Circuit reaffirmed its earlier holding and said this, at least in this egregious case, there was a, definitely a False Claims Act charge pleaded. I think in the, and there's been a couple of circuit court cases, a number of district court cases, it appears that there is some traction for the idea that there is a heightened materiality standard and more that has to be pled um, at, the, at the pleading stage to sur survive a motion to dismiss. Um, about the, the payment history that shows if the government had known this, they would not have paid. Um, there's more of an attention to that issue in the courts. Yeah, I'd agree, and I, I, we've noted that in a number of the cases, and it may be that Escobar is new, the courts are allowing the, the plaintiffs to replead sure. to try and do that. So let me ask you to turn to the voluntary disclosure, uh, voluntary, and I use that word in quotes as we have in the PowerPoint, but the disclosure requirements that uh, companies have as part of the False Claims Act. Yeah, I think we're now turning sort of from the elements to why this is important right. and why you all are here. And the first and foremost is really directed at uh, government contractors. There are similar requirements on the, on the medical side, but uh, as contractors well know, the Federal Acquisition Regulation requires, uh, either as mandatory or as a precatory item, that you develop a code of ethics and business conduct. And a critical element of that is that you need to uh, develop a program commensurate with your size and amount of business you do with the government that is intended to train staff about fraud. It's intended to discover fraud, deter fraud. When it's discovered, remediate it. And most importantly, if there is credible evidence that criminal fraud has occurred uh, or a violation of the False Claims Act has occurred, that it be disclosed to the Inspector General and the contracting officer of an agency. The consequence of failing to do that is that that is an additional ground to be suspended or debarred by the agency 
uh, regardless of how things might turn out. I note that a couple of years ago that the suspension debarment official for the Air Force said that this may not be an independent ground, uh, but it is likely that if you are in that situation, there are going to be plenty of other reasons to debar you. Um, it'll be a layering on, um, and it's something to need to keep in mind. But there are more severe consequences, John. It's the holiday season, and we won't dwell on the criminal consequences for too long, but <clears throat> suffice it to say, it's bad if you get convicted of, of uh, even one count of felony False Claims Act, you can get five years in prison under 287. The, the federal sentencing guidelines will be driven by the loss amount, and the loss amount is going to be all of the money paid by the government for all the claims they say are, um, are fraudulent, and that number can uh, go very high. And you can be assured that the prosecutor on the, on the other side is going to be looking to get full restitution of every penny the government paid. So people who are convicted of False Claims Act violations are destroyed in, in many cases. And, and having gone through a couple of cases where there's a criminal and civil, one of the consequences of a criminal conviction is that it can be applied in the civil case. And to the extent that the facts line up, the government can get summary judgment in a Civil False Claims Act based on the criminal conviction of, say, a senior official. Um, which brings us to the cheery news about what can happen to you on the civil side. Um, it used to be, and there are three, two components. There are civil penalties. There are the damages component. Uh, then if there's a key tam relator, there are the potential fees that will have to be paid to them. But let's deal with the civil penalties first. It used to be uh, that those were 5000 to 10000 They got raised to 5500 to 11000 per violation. So if you were submitting a monthly invoice and the government doesn't discover your violation for three years, you have, you have lined up the potential for some fairly significant fees. If you're in the medical space and you have miscoded 1,000 documents, that can be a lot of money. Um, Congress, again, in expanding the False Claims Act and trying to give additional incentives to key tamulators recently uh, authorized a new way to calculate it. Now the penalties run from about $11,000 to $21,600 per violation. So the amount of penalties has gone up dramatically. The damages amount um, is that one trebles up to treble the amount of the amount that the government has paid out. So if you look at the kind of behemoth that comes at you when the government or a key TAM relator decides to go after you for a False Claims Act amount, it can be significant. There is a challenge, and in addition, you've got key TAM fees, um, and you've got potential whistleblower uh, damages. It used to be that one would go to the government and say, look, let's settle this, dump the fees, uh, dump the penalties, and negotiate maybe down to double damages. That has become much more complicated because of a recent memo issued by the Department of Justice, Ms. Yates. Yeah. And Bobby, you uh, might want to talk about the complications. Uh, the Yates Memorandum, as many of you know, was issued last year. It's the latest iteration in the Department of Justice's effort to give guidance to uh, line prosecutors and to the 94 U.S. Attorney's offices around the country, as well as to its own litigating divisions. And these things grow and build on each other with, with some changes, but they tend to last from administration to administration. This administration last year issued very direct guidelines to its prosecutors and said, you will no longer have uh, you know, the freedom and the flexibility to always settle these matters where a company enters into a deferred prosecution agreement in return for changes to its corporate structure or to changes to the way it does business alone that you must now focus on the employees of the company and their wrongdoing, and it must be part of your effort from the beginning to investigate and pursue individuals who are engaged in wrongdoing. And it puts the company and the employees in a very tough spot uh, as the investigation unfolds because they are now oftentimes adverse to each other. They certainly uh, need to be um, uh, represented in a different manner. There needs to be a separate counsel oftentimes. 
it just makes the process much more difficult. And it makes it more difficult to bring it to a conclusion in terms of negotiating the outcome because the ac access to deferred prosecution agreements and other more favorable settlements will be directly tied to the level of cooperation that the company provided. Now, we don't have a lot of time under this memorandum, so we don't know whether the department has effectively enforced it. They say they have, and they give examples of uh, investigations that have been resolved consistently with the Yates Memorandum. But I think the jury is still out on whether or not it's going to be applied across the board. But it is the guidelines and guidance that's being given to federal prosecutors across the country. So, Tony, let me ask you to, to yeah. go back to the topic that you alluded to, suspensions and debarments and yeah. other sanctions. So there are a host of other consequences, um, and they're set out on the slide, but I wanted to note, too, um, whenever there's a False Claims Act case, um, that is prosecuted by the Department of Justice, separate and apart from the contracting agency or the Department of Health and Human Services. It is likely that while they are secret, if the proceedings are secret, the agency may not know about it, or it might. If the agency becomes aware of it, there is a likelihood that you as a contractor or a medical provider may be suspended uh, under the suspension and debarment rules pending a completion of the investigation and the proceedings. If these investigations and proceedings turn out badly, and that can include a settlement agreement uh, as well as an adverse finding, uh, there's a good potential that you may face debarment, which is the exclusion of the company or a person from doing business with the federal government, from receiving a grant, from being allowed to participate in a Medicare program, from getting an export license. All sorts of kind of things can happen, as well as getting your contracts terminated. Um, the high costs. Um, one of the challenging things is that not only uh, are uh, these cases brought against wrongdoers, um, where they're bad facts. They're brought against a lot of good companies because of a disgruntled employee or an over-eager agent. Um, and the cost of getting out of one of these cases can be very high. There's the internal investigation that needs to be done to find out, uh, did the company do something wrong? And under the Yates memo, if something was done wrong, who did it? And then producing the documents that the government may request. And then correcting the issues and providing training. It's a high-cost venture, and in a few moments, we're going to talk about how you can approach this in a proactive manner. And then there's damage to reputation and loss of business. And those things are very important, uh, and we know oftentimes that we're dealing with good companies that are trying to comply with the law that work very hard to do that. But even good companies, and particularly the larger the company, the more likely it is to, to have employees who are bad apples, people who find themselves in situations where they, they don't do the right thing, whether it's you know, whatever the reason may be. But they end up making mistakes, and then they're afraid to admit it, afraid to make management aware so that corrective action can be taken. And many of these types of circumstances can lead to these types of investigations, to a key time or later uh, bring, coming forward and, and um, working with the government or working on their own to bring an action. I think it's important also to note that for the first time last year, the Justice Department's reported collections in these actions were largely the result of KETAM actions. There had been a KETAM relator involved at some point in the process, and this was the first time that those numbers went over 50 percent. There is an entire bar that has developed out there that pursues these matters, that works with KETAM relators, and I don't think that's going to go away. And so I think we're going to continue to see uh, individuals within your company, individuals that have knowledge about your company as the source uh, and the impetus for these types of actions. Um, and as I said at the very beginning, I think you need to approach it from the standpoint is if you're a government contractor for long enough, uh, it's not really a question of if, but when the government is going to come and ask you questions, seek information, or pursue you under the False Claims Act. Now, it's important to turn to the question of how do you protect one's business. And so John, Maybe you can take up that topic for us. So how did, the, how did these cases begin? How do they come about? Um, lots of different ways. Uh, voluntary disclosure by the company is frequently done. And, and I would say a number of the cases I've worked on have not had the government on the other side at least yet, and have not even had a formal key TAM or later on the other side. But 
some problem in billing or conduct has, has been identified by the company's good compliance procedure and say using a hotline, and the company decides to investigate it and figure out what happened, take whatever actions necessary, and then decide the very important question um, is, is how to disclose and whether to disclose to the government. Tony will talk about that. So some cases start internally and go to a voluntary disclosure. Some occur where there is a call in to a government hotline um, and an agent is, is assigned. Some are and many are spurred by an employee who's got a beat who may have a righteous um, uh, long-standing concern about how the company is operated in a certain area and actually calls up the FBI or calls up the OIG and starts being interviewed and you now have an, an investigative agency on the other side. The, the, the other way that can happen is a key TAM complaint is filed. A savvy employee who, who knows inside information hires a plaintiff's lawyer who does, and, and again there's a big burgeoning bar now of, of uh, lawyers who specialize in this work, and works up a complaint with whatever available information the employee has, files it under seal, that spurs the federal government being contacted, having 60 days and often much longer than 60 days to decide while the complaint is under seal whether to intervene. So in, in all of these different ways, a key TAM investigate or a, a false claims act investigation can begin. And John, how do these then play out from that point? Uh, that's good. Tony's got that, I think. All right. All right. So in some way an investigation starts and it proceeds and if it's it, the frightening thing for a company is while it's under seal of its key TAM case, you have no idea that the Justice Department's investigating you, uh, that there's a complaint out there, although the and, and that's because the seal was intended to protect companies from having their reputation damaged and to allow the Justice Department to conduct an investigation quietly and behind the scenes. The Supreme Court uh, a few days ago issued a decision that said, well, yeah, the seal's important, um, but if the relator happens to blow the seal and talk about it in the newspaper, know that that does not get your lawsuit dismissed. So the value of the seal may have um, taken a dip in the water. And we're certainly back to uh, harming the company's reputation at the very least. That's right. Um, and so we'll have to see what, what the courts do with that. But ultimately, um, it may be that the Justice Department investigates and advises the key TAM relator that there's no case at all. But usually what's going to happen is if it's a self-initiated investigation, the Justice Department will send you a little love letter. It'll say, we've investigated you for the last six months. It appears you committed a million dollars of fraud. And three weeks from now, we're going to file for $3 million and a million dollars in penalties. Would you like to talk about it? Call John Davis. <laughs> the other thing that might happen is uh, you get a call from the Justice Department and they say, look, there's a key TAM case or we've got an investigation that's ongoing and would you like to see it and would you like to talk about it? There then follows an investigation. There could be subpoenas, there could be search warrants, interviews, all that sort of thing that leads up to a negotiation. And your goal is twofold. One, get the Justice Department to agree to dismiss and convince the key TAM relator to dismiss, uh, to get the Justice Department not to intervene, leave the key TAM relator naked, or, which would be to decline, or to decide, look, there's something there and we need to settle the case. One always has the option to litigate, but if one wants to litigate against the federal government and face suspension and debarment, that's a big decision. Usually what happens for government contractors is that they settle the matter. And there are two types of settlements. There's merits-based and there's ability to pay. And merits-based is a normal kind of settlement. You test out the strengths and weaknesses of the respective case and you do that. A lot of times what happens is the government goes and does its investigation and they say, look, we'll settle for you know, half a billion dollars and your company's worth $300 million, and the temptation is to take the keys to the corporation and say, here it is. The Justice Department is not generally in the business of putting people out of business. And so they'll do an ability to pay settlement. You submit a bunch of financial documents. 
They send it to an economist. They come back with a knee-buckling number. You negotiate on it, and you don't settle on the merits. You settle on an ability to pay. What you then enter is into a fairly standard agreement. Um, we've set out on the slide really what those terms are. Um, there's no admission of culpability. Uh, you have to pay either in a lump sum or you can agree to pay over a period of time. If you pay over a period of time, you have to waive the bankruptcy rules. So you can't agree to pay over time and then file for bankruptcy. You don't get to release criminal liability. And you don't get to release the administrative things like suspension and debarment. It's limited to the covered facts. So negotiating what's going to be included can be very important, the dispute between is it too broad or too little? And do you address the relator's fees? As, as, as Bobby talked about a few minutes ago, the Yates memo has complicated this considerably. Um, on the next slide, we talk a little bit about litigating. Um, the goal here is one would prefer to litigate against the key tamer later by itself rather than against the government. And the one thing that often occurs the government can't decide whether to intervene, and so they'll sit on the sideline and watch the case. The key thing is, in any False Claims Act settlement, the Justice Department has to um, approve. So how, what is the strategy that uh, one in, engages in uh, how to deal with this? And the simple fact is, the best defense is a good offense. Um, we live in an age where there's a culture of cooperation. It's no longer good that you have a compliance and ethics program of good business conduct. What the government is looking for is whether you have a culture of compliance in your program. And it starts at the top. The CEO has to follow the rules as much as the lowly janitor. Because if the CEO does not turn in her travel receipts, why should the low-level salesperson? It applies to all, and one size doesn't fit all. It has to be a program that's tailored to one's company, and it has to be dynamic. Now, let me add to your list there that, and John has already addressed this, is the, the culture has to also include an understanding of how to treat whistleblowers. And anyone that steps forward, whether they have a legitimate claim or not, needs to be handled with caution because you, we, you don't know as they step forward exactly what you're dealing with. And so you must, in order to avoid these penalties, you must treat them respectfully and you must take their uh, information seriously and that they must be given an opportunity to provide that information to the appropriate officials. We've also talked about the Yates memo uh, earlier. There has to be, in your thinking, a, a culture of of uh, compliance in terms of an understanding that there may be come a time when you as an em employer are adverse to your employees and you need to approach it uh, with that understanding knowing that they may need separate counsel, that they need, may need to be handled very carefully. Um, there, is, there are going to be rules and concerns about uh, how to deal with information that they possess versus information that the company owns. And so there are all these types of issues that need to be part of the culture because that is the current expectation of the Department of Justice. And if you want, it to, um, if you want to get the case uh, settled in the way that Tony has described, that's going to have to be part of the way you approach it. Now, one of the things that is important to, to have in mind is when one of these matters arises, and they arise in different forms as John has alluded to, you need to have an action plan uh, ready to go in terms of how you respond to them. And John, can you talk to us a little bit about that? The government shows up and is manifest in, uh, in, in one of two ways often. One is a grand jury subpoena. One is a search warrant. A search warrant is, of course, uh, a very disruptive event for any business. 25 agents show up and take all your computers, basically. Um, a grand jury subpoena is a little more civilized, but it can be, it can ask for many years uh, of documents on your server and, and in your business files. Um, we can help and ha I, we have drafted for various clients uh, a, a specific search warrant plan depending on your facility and, and that's a good thing to have. For, for a grand jury subpoena and, and for government contacts in general, just a few basic points ought to, ought to be um, a part of how you train your employees. One is make sure you have a point of contact. 
usually in the general counsel's office. Uh, you want you want to centralize um, uh, communications and responsibility quickly. Two is employees need to know how to handle requests for interviews from agents. They need to know, for instance, that, that they can say no or that they can postpone or they can, that they can and should call company counsel and perhaps ask counsel to be present if they, if they are going to be interviewed. Um, the third thing is, uh, is hire outside counsel. Uh, we, we can get you William uh, Mullen's number on speed dial. Bob, Bobby Higman is, is ready for business. This is what we do. But um, outside counsel can help you uh, be an independent um, uh, investigative agency focused like a laser on your problem who can deal credibly with the government attorneys on the other side. Another element is a litigation hold process usually achieved by a litigation hold memo. It is absolutely critical that your people preserve documents and that they don't destroy or modify them. In many, many cases, the government ends up more interested in how the company responded than in, uh, in, in some cases what the original wrongdoing was. Uh, another element is IT resources. So many of these responses involve dealing with IT technical questions about scope of information, storage of information, search and retrieval of information, devices of employees. All of those issues come up immediately and you have to be ready to go. So and the last let thing let is... Let me ask you there is uh, in terms of your experience now being on this side representing individuals responding to subpoenas, what has been your experience in terms of what the Justice Department wants with regard to the protection of the data that surrounds electronic communication? The Justice Department uh, will send you a subpoena that has is, is got two pages or one page of what they want and then 11 pages of IT specs, uh, which is all the different rules you have to follow in, uh, in responding. So the, the, the government more and more insists on getting the metadata, getting the data in the form that they can use it and they tell you exactly how you're going to give it to them. It can be imperious in cases. It can also be negotiated. So um, one other point and then I'll, because uh, we need to uh, get to your questions. The, the uh, subpoena is often very broadly drafted. It's a, it's a big ham fist. Um, and one of the things that we very often do is go right back to the government and say, well, you've asked for documents back to 2006. In fact, we think you're really only focused on 2009 to 2013. Can we agree to restrict the date range? Those kinds of modifications are readily negotiated in many cases, so you're not always stuck with this, this huge request for documents if you can negotiate something smaller. Uh, you know, one comment I wanted to make that uh, all the folks that are on here are in corporations. Um, we give this talk not infrequently, either to companies or in webinars, and inevitably when the stuff hits the fan, we get a call that's panicked. So I would invite you to think of the movie that recently came out about Mr. Sullinger, who had a plane hit by 50 birds and both his engines went out. And if you remember the scene, his co-pilot reached over to the bookshelf, pulled out a notebook, and opened to the page of what do you do when Thousandbird hits you and both engines go out. That's the kind of thinking that you need in being proactive about how to deal with this situation. Um, it may just be a CID. It could be a drastic thing like a grand jury subpoena. But if you've thought it through, who in the company is going to deal with it, it is less likely that an assistant who is approached by an agent or the CEO who just wants to clear the company by, I can answer everything, will have a plan that will allow you to deal with it in a responsible manner. Um, on the next slide, um, what we've done is set out, don't, don't panic that there's no way to win these cases. There are lots of defenses, um, statute of limitations, there's a materiality uh, requirement. These are all the kinds of things that your counsel will raise for you if, in fact, things get serious. Um, and so, uh, you know, Lance Armstrong has an interesting defense. He's being sued for 9 or $10 million for his doping allegations. He said, well, that's great. But the Postal Service says they got $20 million in benefits. So deduct my $9 million and let me keep going. 
Um, you want to touch on insurance real quickly? Yeah, very briefly, because we'd like to get to your questions, and we'd like to talk a little bit about the future, um, our crystal ball. You know, people enter into D&O and E&O insurance, and the next time they talk to the insurance agent is after they get the letter from the insurance company advising you that you're not covered for any of this. And you say, but why? Well, that's because you didn't sit down as a company with your insurance company and say, this is what we do. We launch satellites. Um, we are a hospital. Uh, we make army boots. And do you cover what we do? And if we commit fraud, will you cover us? And you can get that coverage. It costs something. But if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get covered. And the example I use is a restaurant called P.F. Chang's. It's a chain that's got many restaurants, and it got great cybersecurity insurance. It's outside the False Claims Act. They got great cybersecurity insurance. Their credit card machine was hacked. They said, hey, here's our claim for cybersecurity insurance. And the insurance company said, no, we didn't cover your credit cards. Right? They didn't tell them what they did, and they didn't get covered. So it's something you need to do. Well, you've alluded to this. Let me ask you to do something that's a little bit dangerous, and that's to give us your thoughts in, in projecting forward the next four years during a new presidency, a new Congress. Where do you see the uh, things under the False Claims Act going with, these, with this uh, new leadership? Um, first, I'm going to avoid the, the immediate answer. I'm going to say that you know the new frontier in government contracting is cybersecurity and satellites. There are new low Earth orbit satellites that can be launched by the thousands and put up into space. There are the cybersecurity requirements. People are not paying attention to those yet, and the certifications that people are making that the data is safe, I think that's going to be a major area. Bobby, you've asked me to comment on what the next administration is going to be like, and I'm going to simply say that it is tentatively a Republican administration Tony, aren't you a cabinet nominee? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't know how much I contributed. Yes, we'll see. Um, the, the history of Republican versus Democratic administrations is Democratic administrations tend to micromanage. And if you look at the Labor Department, you see that they have micromanaged in a whole host of areas that affect it. In past Republican administrations, some of those micro regulations that lead to False Claims Act are put to the side. There's less regulation, and what happens is it's more free form, and the government goes, yeah, the contractors go way out on a limb. The prosecutors are still there. They're still looking, and they prosecute. So what you get are often more basic, fundamental, and larger claims against companies, and that's likely to continue. John, you would care to take a chance? I, I would just reiter, reiterate, after Escobar, I think there is more emphasis now in the investigation stage on government knowledge and payment history. Government knowledge has always been an affirmative defense um, in False Claims Act litigation. Now, after Escobar, government knowledge and government periods of, of paying claims over time is an, as, is an aspect of a basic element of the cause of action, materiality. And the defendants are more and more going to be going back to the government and saying, look, you've known about this contractual issue for the last four years. You've paid every claim my client has submitted. How can you now say this is fraud and you owe us all this money? I think there's going to be a renewed effort uh, to defend cases on that basis. Yeah. And I'd make uh, uh, projections or predictions in just three areas. Uh, number one is so we don't have the 2016 statistics from the Justice Department yet as to, in terms of how much money they've collected under the False Claims Act litigation. Those usually come out in early December, so we should see those in the next few days. I anticipate that they'll be every bit as high as they have been in the past four years, so somewhere over $3.5 billion. With that kind of collection effort and the success, I suspect it will continue. And so we'll see that in the years going forward. We've already, already alluded to the success of relators, uh, uh, key TAM relators who have brought you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of the litigation or been involved in it, 80% uh, of it in the last year. 
there's a there's a bar that has grown up. They were going to continue to be active, and so I think you'll continue to see key TAM relators uh, bringing these matters. And finally, with respect to the Yates Memorandum, we find that every administration will alter in some way the directions that are given to prosecutors about how to resolve matters. But the truth has been that they never quite all go away. And so I suspect that the incoming administration, they may adjust the Yates Memorandum, but I think there will still be a premium on the cooperation uh, um, uh, by the company as against its employees. I wanted to interject one final positive note because it's the holiday season. I said that the laws have expanded. Yesterday, the Department of Health and Human Services issued a regulation, um, which we haven't had a chance to study in depth, but it appears to provide a safe harbor for certain kinds of conduct that were deemed to be violative of the False Claims Act in the past, and that includes ambulance coverage, the cost of ambulance coverage, and certain discount drugs. So that if, let us hope that that perhaps is a trend, that there might be a rollback of the law in the future, but that's a little bright spot. Okay. Now let me tell you, if you have questions but have not yet submitted them via the chat feature on your screen, please do so now. And while you're doing that, let me just point to the last slide, the references. We put a number of links there that, um, that link you to things we've talked about today. Please feel free to use those. If you have questions about any of those, we're available to answer those questions at any point. Now, Paul, I'm told you have a question. We do have a question. Um, thank you for one of the attendees uh, providing that. I work for a small company that does not have a robust training program pertaining to false claims. How expensive would a training program have to be for a small business? Okay. John? Um, so we often are asked to come in and train companies. Um, and do so, and depending on our relationship to the company, if, if it's a cost issue, we often, uh, to some of our good clients, uh, come in and just spend time with them. Uh, so there's no cost associated with it. Um, training classes on the False Claims Act um, are not that long. They're an hour or two. But one should not look at the False Claims Act in isolation. Um, the False Claims Act is really the bad result of something else that has gone on in the company and should be part and parcel of a larger compliance program. And how one shapes a compliance training program for a large or small company varies. Um, I've often said that the compliance program for a two-person company is you always have two people sign the checks. Um, as you get bigger, uh, there's more to be done, and it's really a discussion to decide how long and how intensive it is. John, anything you want to add? No, I think that covers it. Paul, any other questions? Uh, there is. Uh, we have two more. Um, how does the mandatory voluntary disclosure requirement square with the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination? Um, it is considered a civil uh, disclosure, and it is a privilege uh, that one has to have a government contract, and it's a condition of receiving that government contract. One always has the right to assert the Fifth Amendment so that one is not incriminated, um, but one may pay some consequences because of that. And I would add, importantly, that the Fifth Amendment is a right of individuals and not of corporations. So there, there's, there's uh, <clears throat> a, a, an individual sole proprietor who is a contractor can could assert a Fifth Amendment claim, a, a company could not. And keep in mind that with respect to the Yates Memorandum, it is the, the, the cooperation is required in order to obtain the benefits of favorable settlement. That's, that's the goal of that memorandum. All right. Uh, next one, suppose the government has paid a company under terms similar to those pertinent to my company. Can I discover such payments? Can I invoke the payments to the other company in defense of mine? Hmm. I don't know the answer to the question. I, I hope that Tony does. I can only say this comes up a lot. Um, and uh, that as a, a, a company is billing the government in a particular way in a particular industry, and the first thing the CEO says when I meet with them is, there, there's four other businesses in our region who do the exact same thing. I can tell you, though, it comes up a lot. It's often very difficult to prove. It's difficult to find individual companies that will come forward. 
it's difficult to find expert witnesses who are willing to identify particular people. And, and so many times it's, it's hard to make a record about what the industry practice is. Yeah, and I have sort of two responses to that because um, we've seen it a lot. And every time a car gets stopped for speeding, their answer to the policeman is, everybody else was doing it. <laughs> and the policeman says, yeah, but it was your unlucky day. Um, and the fact is that we've had agents say, oh, really? There are other companies doing it? Why don't you tell us about them and we'll go after them too? But in the meantime, you're going to pay the consequence. Uh, we have time for one more. Um, why hasn't the FCA, FCA been challenged under U.S. constitutional provision prohibiting excessive penalties and fines? Well, it has. Um, and it involves the Eight, the Eighth Amendment and the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment. And a number of years ago, uh, the Supreme Court said in U.S. v. Halper that the penalty provision, which at the time was, I think it was a thousand medical claims at about fourteen dollars a piece, and add up back then it wasn't. I think it was five thousand to eleven thousand, and it was about a million dollars in penalties for what were a couple of thousand dollars of incorrectly submitted. Claims and the Supreme Court held at that time that that was an unconstitutional violation of the eighth grade, eighth grade, eighth, uh, <laughs> eighth Amendment. Um, a number of years later, that decision was uh, reconsidered, and the Supreme Court has come out with a standard, and the Fourth Circuit has talked about it, about the factors that one applies in considering whether the penalty portion of the False Claims Act is excessive. A portion of the False Claims Act, particularly the damages portion, is considered compensatory and therefore not a constitutional violation. Once you get into the penalty provision, it may be that the amount can be so excessive that it will not pass muster. I think the Fourth Circuit recently noted a case that if the penalty is four times the amount of the damages, that might run into trouble. They allowed a penalty of, I think, $100 million recently, and they said, well, it was only 3.6 times the damages and allowed it. The other is under the Equal Protection Clause, um, the 14th and the 15th Amendment, uh, 14th and the 5th Amendment, the Due Process Clause, and there are similar factors that are applied there that it is thought that if the penalty gets too excessive, it might run into uh, problems. The fact is that the problem we face like the Escobar case, is so many of the cases that reach the higher courts, the facts are so dreadful that the courts are tempted to allow the penalty to exist. And the companies that are prosecuted, which have far less egregious uh, uh, defalcations, are left to bear the consequences. All right, well, I think that's all the time that we have today. First of all, let me thank everybody for participating. We're very grateful that you joined us. And in closing, please contact any one of us if you have additional questions or would like to make suggestions for future webinar topics. Following today's webcast, we will be sending follow-up information including an evaluation and prompt to confirm interest in CLE credits. We hope you will join us for future events. Have a great day.